Good morning. Will God permit the Egyptians to strengthen their dominance over the world? Let's read at our reading, Jeremiah 46, verses 13 to 19. The word that the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet, how Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would come and strike the land of Egypt. Why are your valiant men swept away? They did not stand because the Lord drove them away. He made many fall. Yes, one fell upon another, and they said, Arise. Let us go back to our own people and to the land of our nativity. From the oppressing sword, they cried there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He has passed by the appointed time. As I live, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts, surely as Tabor is among the mountains and as Carmel by the sea, so he shall come. O oh, you daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself to go into captivity, for Nof shall be waste and desolate without inhabitant. No, God will not permit the Egyptians to dominate the world. God's going to check their power here by Babylon. And even Babylon is only granted a limited time of dominance. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are confirmed by secular history, but there's some things that just aren't. And, and this is one of them. This is a case where we're not quite certain where this fits in the timeline. There's two or three pretty good options, but we're not absolutely certain exactly where. There was a fragmentary Babylonian tablet that was found not many years ago, and this traces uh, a conflict between Nebuchadnezzar and Amasis of Egypt back to the 37th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, and that means it puts it in about 586 B.C. So this very well could be at about that time. There's another clue about this that's interesting, too. The cities that are mentioned here, the Egyptian cities, you know, there's the Upper Nile and the Lower Nile, and these cities are all in the Lower Nile. So it seems like there was an incursion by Babylon into Egypt, probably never got up into the upper reaches of the Nile, but it did come and attack some of the lower cities in Nile. So quite interesting those pieces. Here's another thing that matches history. Do you know that the Egyptians often used for to as the cannon fodder in their army, so to speak? They used a lot of they had a lot of soldiers that were from conquered nations that they had conquered. They they probably weren't that excited to die for Egypt and they wanted to go home. They said, let us go back to our own people and back to the land of our nativity, verse 16. So there you have some pieces that all sort of match that historical situation. But anyway, verse 15 is interesting because it tells us why they failed. This wasn't a fair fight. This wasn't a battle between, you know, the Egyptians have this many soldiers and weapons and the Babylonians have this many soldiers and weapons. That's not how this was. Verse 15 says they didn't stand. Why? Because the Lord drove them away. God had determined that Egypt would not win. They couldn't win then. So God allowed Babylon to be victorious in this case. Always remember that God is forever in ultimate control. And don't think for a moment that he endorses all that the strutting oppressors uh, uh, do. He, just because somebody's a Hitler or a Stalin or a Lenin and you've got tens of millions of people being murdered here and there, uh, th that doesn't mean that that has God's endorsement. I think a lot of times God holds his nose, so to speak. God just barely tolerates some of these awful murderous leaders scattered here and there. Don't think that he endorses all that they do. That's not the case at all. He only permits them to do some of what they would do. I mean, what would have happened if Stalin could have done everything he would have liked to do? I think there'd have been a lot more dead Soviets. So God's, God puts the brakes on even these awful people. None of us know how much worse things would have been in Nazi Germany without God limiting, perhaps, some of the things that happened. Always remember, God loves righteousness, and he hates oppression. He hates unfairness. He hates an unjust balance. He hates oppression. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for watching over our lives and our world. Thank you for giving us free will. Help us to use it for the advancement of your kingdom. Uh, Lord, be with us uh, in different ways that we are uh, pressured by governments and situations. Help us always to look to Jesus and follow and find your pathway for us. Bless and help your people, Lord. Help us to take the right messages from these uh, messages uh, on judgments on the different places like this one that we just looked at. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. No, he's not going to allow the Egyptians to become overly ascendant. It's not going to happen. The fact is that God has a plan to let sin run its course, and when that is achieved, when the revelation of how bad sin is and how good righteousness is, when that revelation is made, God's going to put an end to all this. A lot of us call this conflict between good and evil. We have a name for it. We call it the great controversy. May God be with you in this day and whatever you're doing.